Aloha, everyone. Hello. Take a moment to look around and see who's here with us today. Very nice. Nice to see you all. Mm. <clears throat> all right, well, we can get started with our sitting for a little while. So getting settled into your seated posture. Letting the eyes come to close. Just beginning by noticing whatever is arising in your awareness right now in the most predominant way. Experiences in the body. experiences and the other physically based sense doors of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. Our experiences in the mind, heart. Not worrying that you need to grab onto them or hold on to them. Sometimes in our intention to see clearly, there's an aspect of mind that tries to slow things down tries to hold on, tries to fix our knowing onto whatever experience. is happening. And in some ways it's surprising that we can do that a little bit. We can sort of manage the pace at some periods. But we also can be aware of the kind of artificialness of that and the strain of that against the flow of experience. That 
wherever we try to hold on to is already gone. By the time we set that intention to hold more closely, that it's a new moment has arisen in the body, the senses, the mind. And so it's a fresh moment of knowing as well, of consciousness, of awareness, mindfulness. And so we may choose to simply sit and abide in the flow of experience as it's arising and passing with the various sense doors. But normally we do encourage a kind of anchoring, a gathering of the attention around one field of experience. Maybe the stream of sound is the primary object. Maybe the sense of the whole body seated and the range of physical experiences. arising and passing throughout the body. Or more narrowly, the area of the abdomen. As we notice the changing experiences of air element, of increasing pressure, decreasing pressure of movement, motion, tension, relaxation. And it's important to see just how fluid all of these experiences are. Always moving, always changing, always arising and passing. Some may feel persistent, familiar, giving the impression of solidity, of stability. But when we look closely, they're still changing, coming and going. Changing in their intensity, whether it's throbbing or pulsing. smoother movements and motions in the body, in the breath, or a persistent sound when seen clearly is still broken up into smaller waves and vibrations, tones. It takes a liveliness of attention to keep up with these changes. A lightness, a fluidity, a dexterity.
because ultimately there is no stable, solid mind that's observing the body or the breath or sounds. And consciousness is arising alongside each new moment of bodily experience. or of mental, emotional experience. And the mind is also coming and going, though it may seem stable and solid. It's not easy to always see. But our concentration wavers, the mind wanders, awareness moves from one thing to the next. Mental chatter, opinions, preferences, knowings. When we observe it, it's hard to argue about any stability we observe. Just familiar patterns as we might also experience in the body. The breath. In the world of sound. And so the mind is moving, the body is changing, all sense experience is arising and passing. We're not trying to hold on to the breath, receiving knowing, letting go. And letting go of the knowing. If we are holding on, it's to the stale memory of the body or the mind. But it's no problem. There's a fresh moment to be known, to be received. Always new, always changing. Careful of the mind that longs for stagnancy. Dullness, dormancy. And finding a primary object, observing it, observing it change, observing the heart's response, observing the mind's wandering. Everything that can happen is worthy of our mindfulness, attention, care. And finding our way back to a primary field of experience. In the breath, the body, the stream of sound. Aware of what we're observing. 
and observing the awareness.
Uh, Steve, you have to unmute there. How's that working? Okay. Uh, I was talking with a few friends online yesterday. Um, and we recognize that similar themes in our lives, in other friends' lives, in our students' lives. And, and that is um, like an opposition that shadows us around or throughout life, taking different forms and different, and different periods of time. You know, not a, like an archetypal uh, Job being tested again and again by, by, by the Lord. M more, um, more impersonal. If, if, you know, things that just seem to come up that ultimately um, have nothing to do with our goodness, with who we are. Uh, and it's like a, a nemesis. And so I mentioned the, I enjoyed reading about the Buddha's um, brother-in-law and cousin and a fully ordained monk in his order known as Devadatta. And, and uh, when I took a month off to do a self-retreat uh, in a cowrie forest in uh, New Zealand, I brought, I brought the three volumes of the classic 547 Jataka tales our birth story, birth stories, the Buddha to be in his previous life, lives, working out the paramis until dana, generosity is perfected, until sila, in the many times he'd give his life rather than do something um, with ill will as an intention or greed and so forth. All, all of the paramis, wisdom and energy and patience, loving kindness, equanimity, resolution, um, usually were represented. Sometimes the, the, same, the, the same parami throughout one of the stories, sometimes, sometimes it was a few of the paramis. And uh, how it came, how it supposedly came about was um, the Buddha would be, would approach a group of monks and he'd hear a story. The Buddha would elaborate on the story, you know, well, right in this spot that you're sitting or uh, this area that you're talking about. Once upon a time, I was, uh, I was born as a deer, you know, I, I was born in this uh, Kusinara's kingdom as a young prince and and such and such happened and so and then he tell the Jataka story that that's the legend one of the legends behind their origin uh, and so I had in mind taking a period between three and six o'clock in the afternoon uh, when I finished a, a, a longer walk on a ridge near the cabin I was in uh, through Kauri trees. When I finished that longer walk, it was about three o'clock, and I'd read, study, ingest, and digest the Jataka tales, I don't, automatically relanguaging and taking out the, as best I could the misogyny and um, the comparisons with Western theistic religious forms. I kind of just cut to the chase to the essence of the story and followed it along. And I would say of the 547 Jataka tales, a huge percentage had Devadatta in them, shadowing the Bodhisattva 
the Buddha to be in one way or another, trying to trick him or, uh, you, you know, because De Devadatta was, was informed. He was intelligent. And he, he knew that, uh, he knew the story or legend that this particular uh, monk was a bodhisattva with the paramis that will end in awakening, a Buddhahood awakening. And so it was his job to try to mess that up in, in each of these lives. Even when they were young, um, the way they played together was different. Um, because Gotama, the, the Buddha, Bodhisattva or Buddha to be, w was a natural and, and he was good and his arrows would hit the target. He had that ability to feel, you know, one with the bow, with the string, with his eyes, with the object of his eyes and the target. And Devadatta was really competitive. So he was kind of pushy and arrogant and and um, over he'd overshoot. He was still really a good athlete and stayed as close to Gotama as possible, but he was never quite up up to it. But but that's his job, you know, because his karmic quirk, even though he's a a relative of of the Buddha of the Gotama's family and a direct relative as a cousin and brother-in-law of the of the Buddha to be, he had that karmic knot that he was supposed to prevent the bodhisattva from his awakening, or that he was supposed to harm in some way. So throughout, so throughout all the lives, you get used to this bodhi, uh, this sort of um, devadatta figure as a bodhisattva um, killer. You know, he's, he's out there to prevent the joy and the release of opening to the truth of things as they are. Uh, so he was still a really good monk. In fact, he was, he was the kind of monk with leadership capabilities and intelligent. There was just that little quirk in him, a power of me not quite on set, you know, in sync with the others. And so he, he was divisive in the whole Sangha. He didn't just target the Buddha, but this phantom nemesis that if we think about it, we, we all, we have, we have had or have or will have, you know, some figure in human form or non-human form or an energetic composition of some sort where, you know, we just feel defeated or attacked or abandoned or something like that. So in this case of his, his popularity was strong, not among the wiser um, disciples of the Buddha uh, and the and the top um, leaders, awakened nuns and top disciples of, of the nuns. They, they saw through that easily. But he had really good samadhi. And, and he misused the samadhi. He misused the laser-like focus of his mental energies to entertain, to uh, seduce, to draw in, to sort of create a magnetic field where, it, where disciples would feel good with him. So he ended up having like 500 of his own disciples. And they began, began to sit and meet and talk separately from the awakened one and his top disciples, Sariputta and Moggallana and, uh, and the many other extraordinary monks and nuns. And, and it got to the point where he, he added on to the precepts. 
He, he made everyone vegetarian. Even though they were in a place, and the, the reason why the, there's the, the, the rule, that there wasn't a rule against or for, for or against any particular kinds of food, you know, it, the, the precept was in, in the Vinaya of the Sangha was to be nurtured and to accept what was offered and not to ask for anything in particular. And so you go to a household and they only serve vegetables, you took that. You go to a household where, where, where they also serve, you know, fish or other, um, other kinds of food, you'd accept that. You wouldn't, generally, when we'd go on Pindapat in, in Burma and Thailand, you don't even see what goes into the bowl because you're, you're bowing in respect and holding the bowl forward. And then at the end, as you come up and the giver is bowing to you and you bow back, that's a moment of connection. If they choose to have it, they choose to have that, that beautiful momentary glimpse connection. And, and so they, they went off on their own, the Devadatha and the, his 500 monks um, and you know, practice in a much more rigorous way. He made very strong, um, you know, practices n not too dissimilar to what um, Gotama was doing. Cer 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 uh, shortly after he left the palace and became a became a sadhu in the forest and did all those really intense forest practices of you know of food uh, renunciation down to where it was said he was took a grain of rice and intense breathing practices and becoming so thin he'd fall over when he would kneel to urinate or defecate he was in bad shape at the end of that six years um, and david data it was always in the trees and shadows and enjoying all of this, you know, and once in a while would uh, you know, just have a conversation. Don't you see how difficult this is, cousin? You know, you're, you're straining yourself. You're liable to get a bad back, you know, sooner or later. Uh, you're, you're just in bad shape. You know, why don't you, why don't you go do something else? Other people will take care of themselves. And, and so it would go, it, very similar to what Mara, the personification uh, of greed, hatred, and delusion, the mythical personification, uh, regarded as a deva, kind of deva gone bad. He had that kind of status. Whereas Devadatta was human, very human, and the Buddha's cousin, and he acted out you know, kind of against uh, the straightforward teachings of the Buddha. So, you know, when the Buddha spoke about how he was introduced himself by his own experience to dukkha, he, he, even even before those those moments that you heard us talk about uh, the heavenly messengers, you know, seeing a old person, sick person, dead person and a mendicant more peaceful than peace itself. Before that, he began to notice um, the fields around him that were being plowed and, and, there, and uh, the striving and struggling of the oxen, you know, with its, um, um, with its, with the halter and the, brace that's pulling the plowshare, the struggling and the, and the sweating and struggling and, and cuts of, of the humans, you know, running alongside uh, the plowshares, planting the seeds and so forth. And then as the plow was running, um, it would dig up the soil and, and bugs would fly up and be hurt. Uh, and as the bugs were flying up, birds would fly down to eat the bugs. 
And so young Gotama, he witnessed all this, you know, just a little window, a little Shakespearean stage set of everything in it, dukkha. The, the, the humans, the animals, uh, the, the, the toiling, the struggling, the weariness, uh, and then um, not much reward. You know, not much reward, not much understanding of, of what they were doing. Uh, and then later, with uh, the experience of having left the palace and gone through the pra hard practices and then becoming the Buddha, he, he spoke more precisely and articulately, articulately about um, being young, the conceit and arrogance, and, and, and how they become defenses, they, how, how they dissociate and distract from what the body really is. It, it was his way of seeing, uh, of saying, uh, if we don't look, if we don't examine, we don't see the datu nature, the elemental nature, earth as texture, water as fluidity and support, uh, heat as temperature, and air as uh, support and pressure and oscillation and vibration. It's the entirety of how we experience the body. But when one is young, they if they have that sort of conceit and, and arrogance of youth and, and don't really examine to have an intuitive understanding, a moment-to-moment -moment intuitive understanding of the anicca, dukkha, anatta nature of the datus, of this body as it is. And, and so they stay kind of going through the rounds of samsara. They continue to wander in samsara and, and are curious about when their body changes and ages if they don't have a teacher and continue with their distractions, increasing their distractions and their defenses against still not examining the body as it is, what an unpleasant sensation is and what a pleasant one is or what a neutral one is and how the mind relates to these phenomena happening in the body, uh, this vibration, that pressure, this heat, and so forth, but recognizing the, the natural um, patterning that is the essence of the elements. It is their nature to behave a certain way. Their dhamma behaves a certain way. And why, when there's a certain kind of wind, uh, some beings are affected by that wind. Others are not. You know, our temperature changes. Just to have a basic understanding of that is to realize the anicca nature and dukkha nature and anatta nature of the body from, from the place where we're still relatively healthy, ideally when we're in the prime of youth. But the Buddha is saying that that's really, really difficult. Youth don't want to see that. And they'll just go on to the next thing. If something is difficult, they'll go on to the next thing. And sometimes we, that's the form of a devadatta in our life. Someone who might be stuck in their own defense of not understanding what empathy is, not understanding what communication is, the reciprocity of listening and speaking with the intention to understand, not the intention to uh, be right or prove anything, but just to connect and, and not having that is, you know, having that is like a, a precious and rare friend. Not having that can be a real challenge at times, especially if that 
that Devadatta energy or figure in our lives, whenever they show up, and sometimes they show up and disappear and show up and disappear, but nevertheless, it's like you feel a little relief when they leave. <laughs> you feel a little happiness. <laughs> at, at a retreat, I was, we were once at with Upandita for s several months. Um, there was one yogi there that that I, I just I, I just felt like a hungry ghost energy from. Like they're pulling from me, you know, pulling from my gut, pulling from my goodness. And, and, and other than that, you know, mixed with being very intent on staying uh, focused and doing the practice was an unknowing of what was happening, a non-recognition of what that energy is. In fact, that's the first time I used the term um, hungry ghost. I've, I've used other terms and, and later helped understand the projection of envy and jealousy uh, and its cover of shame, unworthiness, and so forth. But when you when we, when we don't really know what's happening, all these energies can come into our body. And we don't know why we feel shame or bad, or we don't know why we feel, did I do something wrong? You know, it's totally mind fabricated, but, it, but we don't understand what that energy is. Well, after five weeks, that person left and was no longer, you know, practicing, no longer um, in the room close to mine, and everything changed. I just felt such a huge release. I mean, I, I didn't do anything. It was just this Deva Data energy was here and then was gone, and. I felt really different. I, I, I didn't make any judgment about it. I, I recall feeling happy. <laughs> and it was, it, it was a good friend, so it was someone I, I would be, you know, intimately engaged in later. But then and there, it seemed the, the role was like a, a nemesis, a devadatta, an interferer. Um, and so it was helpful. It, it was just helpful to recognize and see the see it in, in an impersonal way. That what this person's unfelt energies, places that haven't been examined, uh, be it envy, jealousy, shame, unworthiness. I'm this vulnerable sponge, you know, just out there feeling all the elements through me, through the body, and, and wafting through the mind, uh, you know, all, all kind of together, all kind of in unison at times, like a murmuration when, when those uh, um, sparkling starlings suddenly group and they're all a mad mess of 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 bird and color and then and then they're this perfect rhythm that they fly at such such a natural grid of order you can't imagine there's no comprehension of how that happens and, and then i noticed seeing this where we were practicing these startlings that's why I'm mentioning it because it helped. It, it helped seeing them, seeing the chaos and suddenly, suddenly coming together, and then going off in this uniform and, and its leader in the same way as the leader of a goose. Um, the draft created by the by the lead goose. It's called a slipstream. And the immediate 
close geese behind them, like with the starlings, also have a draft, but they're using the draft of the leader's slipstream, and then they're adding to their own, and it's like the whole flock of geese are just effort, effortlessly moving through air in a slipstream. When we practice that way, and some quality, if we're practicing a Brahma Vihara, uh, say it's the metta quality that, that completely overcomes us in a good way. You know, loving kindness with wisdom. And it pulls everything together. In fact, metta as one of the paramis is known to be a catalyst for all the other skillful states. We usually think that's, that's mindfulness and certainly mindfulness has that ability as well. But I found it, I found it significant that metta was mentioned as, as the catalyst for the other paramis and other skillful states. So we, if you feel that coming together and pulling, you know, like in a, a slipstream fashion, uh, all the other skillful states, that all the qualities that we've been practiced, just feeling them naturally and effortlessly come together, you know, like, like in it, like in a pattern, though we may not see it because that's conceptual. And we may be mostly non-conceptual. Maybe we're doing favasana, but we've done a, some metta for, for the energy of it and for, for metta as a lens to see things through the eyes of kindness and friendship. In daily life, as in some retreats, there, there, there might be someone, I mean, probably any of you, most of you who have been to live retreats, someone there bugged you. <laughs> you know, you don't like how they wear their shoes or how they walk or how they, uh, you know, wear those uh, coats that are nylon and scratchy and uh, an insult to our ear door and we don't like how they eat you know we don't like anything we may never have actually seen their face if we're practicing and just watching you know feet and movement but we recognize we recognize people uh, often throughout a long retreat by their shoes and by their clothes lower clothes and by the mannerisms, the way they walk, we get really keen that way. And it's interesting to, you know, withhold the curiosity of identifying them, which is just a proliferation that we would, that we would go off on a papancha mind trip about. You know, so we, we just look at the form, keep to that. Usually at every retreat, someone or something, you know, the cottage, cottage isn't quite right, or there's a leak and uh, something wrong with the bathrooms and just some little thing. And maybe that's the Devadatta energy that's gonna follow, follow you throughout the retreat. And we just get used to recognizing the Devadatta energy and uh, sending it metta, sending it compassion because it's starving for it. That's why it's around in the first place. Uh, same way devas come around, even yakas, who are, have a combination usually of skillful, unskillful, you know. Sometimes they're rascals and sometimes they, they help us um, move to higher levels of dhamma by, by influencing our thoughts or creating some kind of influence in how we practice. So we don't want to demonize Devadatta, but we, we want to be careful. They're powerful lessons. In daily life, it's the same thing. Uh, and even, you know, someone 
we've known for years or decades. And when we have the thought of them, our, something in our body contracts. <laughs> you know, it doesn't feel good. It's an uncomfortable sensation. And, um, you know, maybe someone else just suddenly changes. You know, like they're moving through adolescence into teenage years, even though they're much older, but they're just going through, you know, kind of acting out uh, developmental issues that were never formed, never properly nurtured. And so sometimes we have relationship, relationships with, with such beings, humans usually, and it helps us to understand their behavior when we, when we realize that something must have happened that they lack empathy. Something must have happened that their strongest defense is ignorance. You know, something must have happened in their causes and conditions of the past where they suddenly feel equal or even superior. Remember the three kinds of conceit is I'm worse than, I'm better than, or I am the same as. All three are still comparing mind, the mana in the Pali, and, and that's a kalesa, that's a torment of the mind. It's an unhealthy. And, but if you have it and even know about it, it, it doesn't concern you because it feels arrogance and superiority, they feel good. You feel on top of the world. And they effectively cut off uh, being able to know Anicca and be able to know particularly Dukkha. Uh, con conceit is the quality, the Kalesa, that hides Dukkha. Craving hides Anicca in particular. Uh, remember, any of these can be our doorway. And so, you know, we want to know, we want to understand, well, what's wrong with craving? Well, it prevents us from a direct intuitive insight into a Nietzsche nature. And, and so what's wrong with conceit? You know, other than just noticing that, that comparing mind puts us off balance, you know, uh, destroys the unity of the body-mind system. And, well, well what about anatta? Uh, what hides anatta is wrong views. You know, views that our happiness is somewhere out there doing these sort of things to receive material benefit or sense benefit, you know, or um, belief in a, another system that's going to save us. That's, a, that's a, one of the wrong views. But essentially the wrong views are not understanding anicca, dukkha, anatta. Not understanding the Eightfold Path. So this particular teaching from the Buddha is, uh, is really built around dukkha. It was dukkha he saw in, in, in the toiling in the fields of, of the men and the plows and the oxen and the bugs and the birds and so forth. And, um, and it was dukkha that he experienced when he realized that he was doing the wrong practice in the forest. And then in his awakening, he realized, well, dukkha is there because of craving. And conditions for craving to fall away, there's no dukkha the freedom of the mind. And, and that's how he discovered the Eightfold Path, the fourth noble truth being the Eightfold Path. And, th and that's what he talked about. That's the first thing he talked about when he met his five companions uh, after some time, after some times of enjoying his awakening. He, he traveled to the area where five companions who had abandoned him you know, they're kind of like his uh, Devadatas because they felt he was 
caving in by by eating and getting nurtured again after the starvation period during his punishing and unhealthy forest practices. Uh, but there they were, and they reluctantly had a, a place for him to sit. And then his, his first talk, two of them, I think, were enlightened, and the other three were partly, had partly touched, been touched by the Dhamma, and not long after, all five of them were fully awakened and became his first disciples. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and try to um, pull in, wind up how we can use everyday life as a practice. You know, uh, you can call it whatever you want. Um, David Datta is, is handy for me because I had read so much about him in the, in the early, in the early texts on the Buddhist birth stories. And then you still see him mentioned quite often. Uh, so I'll end with, a, he did finally hurt the Buddha. He, he, he was trying to get a big rock to roll down and crush him. But the big rock broke up apparently, and only a relatively small rock hit his ankle, injured it. You know, it was a long time healing. In fact, he may have had a little limp uh, for the rest of his life. The, the, la the last, the ending story is a much bigger attempt and more direct of Devadatta tried to use to kill his cousin and the leader of the Sangha after his own separate sangha had failed. And, and that was to, to get Nalagiri, the beloved elephant, temple elephant, to, to get him drunk, to pay, to pay workers to put wine in his water, and then to throw little darts at, at the body of the elephant, Nalagiri, and to harass him in such a way that eventually it went over the tipping point. And of course he'd feel anger. Of course he'd feel rage. Uh, but by men who usually tre treated him kindly, he was being attacked. And so it was time so that Nalagiri, the mad elephant, would run down this road, this lane, as the Buddha was walking up with his Sangha to receive alms. And Ananda, his beloved cousin, um, saw Nalagiri coming. In fact, I think he was the first to realize that this was set up by Devadatta, also a cousin of Ananda. So Ananda sees Nalagiri coming and he goes and stands in the road, you know, like he's going to protect the Blessed One with, uh, with, with, what, with whatever way he could. And the Buddha said, Ananda, you better leave this to me. And so Ananda stepped aside. And, and the Buddha just called up the purest, most powerful jhana, wisdom, infused metta, and let it roll out, cycle out like this little powerful feather tornado of kindness and gentleness, connection and goodness. And David is char uh, charging, you know, bleeding from some of the from some of the darts, and and feeling confused, feeling uh, um, lack of wisdom the ignorance of intoxication of the mind. And so he came right up, and the Buddha didn't move. He just kept radiating this unconditional, measureless, boundless, loving kindness until it sobered the mind of Nalagiri and then calmed his body somewhat from all the stings of the spears and the darts and so forth and brought him to a place 
of, of peace, reverence. And at the very end, Malagiri kneels down and bows in deep respect for the Buddha. You know, because Metta had, Metta had cleansed him. It wasn't a superpower of the Buddha. It just Metta, Metta's, like love, loves. So impersonal. It was impersonal, but the Buddha had the knowledge to access it and use it in a way that illustrates how it can tame um, a momentarily, insanely burning mind and bring it, that, bring it to its natural level of peacefulness. So we can think, when we think about our devadatas, those who bug us now and again or all the time, just think too that we're the Buddha and we're Nalagiri and we have the Brahma Vihara capacity to put out the fires to some degree. Not all of them and not all of the time. But one reason we practice the Brahma Vihara so much is because they allow us to do Vipassana. They give us the strength and capacity and space and spirit and creativity to move through and accept what the Buddha wanted us to accept. That existence is dukkha. Life is dukkha. Everywhere we look, everything we do, we can all have the same label. We can have the same label, anicca, changeability. Uh, in fact, changeability is, is dukkha. And the uncontrollability, the lack of any agent or agency that can change any of those things. And that realization is liberation. That liberation is the peace of understanding. Take a little time, Jesse, if people have questions. Let's do it. But actually, I have yeah. a question. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, do you remember, because I, I, like, I don't always have the sequence in order of the, when Devadatta tried to split the Sangha, was he expelled then? And is that why that rule around spilling the Sangha exists? And was he still a monk when he tried to kill the Buddha? Or was that sort of after he had been expelled? And then lastly, what happens to him after the Buddha dies? Is he, does, does he show up again in the stories? Um, I know there's not I think, more stories. I, yeah, I, I think there's somewhere that talks about his death. I don't know about his rebirth, but, mm. but it, you know, it, there's a, a, a very vivid story of, of him falling into hell mm. and it being witnessed by monks with the powers such as Moggallana, who, who can see that, who can see that happening. Actually, the hap, our happy Sayadaw, Myatang Sayadaw, saw where Chaswa Sayadaw went in his death. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was totally in sync with our, our, our nun nurse, our nun doctor, Dr. Um, Makamala Yani? No. Oh. The older one. His personal physician at the. At oh. The Dr. Cherry? Dr. Cherry? Dr. Cherry. Oh, yeah, Dr. Dr. Cherry. Cherry. Yeah. Cause she was there with him and he had been lying down and just, and just resting and making space for the, the pain of the cancer and so forth and the medic. And. And, and waiting for his mind to clear up, you know, un unencumbered by the medicine. And at a certain point, Dr. Cherry recognized that 
this could be his time to practice just before he goes out. So, so he, he, so she, he said, you know, um, Charles Vasayadov, you can sit up now and fold your hands. And he did. He did exactly as she said. He sat up, you know, and crossed his legs, folded his hands. And she said he went, you know, through the Brahma Viharas, uh, like a kind of jhana level, getting the mind really refined, we talk a wechara, and the PT, uh, you know, ec ecstatic state, and then the sukha, soothing contentment, sweetest happiness in samsara, and then the equanimity, and beyond all those opposites, and then out of the concentration entirely into vipassana. She said she could follow him do that. And then Myatong Sayadaw said, well, that's correct. But when he went into the Vipassana, he, he, followed, he followed the Vipassana, seeing things as they are, the Yata Buddha nature, and ended up in such and such a um, Brahma, Brahma realm. realm. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask him. Or we have to ask his... Um, his caretakers there mm -hmm. are maybe Dr. Cherry. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cherry are, are the, the guy who is translating for me. So that, that's, I think mm -hmm. that's, yeah. I, I see David Atta sort of scattered throughout, and, and I think their sutta is just about David Atta, uh, and I, I think there's just a lot of space to 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 make it symbolic and make it sort of a a um, touchstone of our of our own practice. Mm -hmm. However, however we find it easy to do, because it's 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 so easy to to drop into impersonality. Then mm -hmm. this David this David out of figure, you know. Why can't he have more empathy? <laughs> you know, why does he have to have, be so arrogant? How can he not see that his, it's folly to n not do what he should be doing? recognizing his youth because the ignorance of youth is you think you're going to live forever you're, mm -hmm. you're not going to get old mm -hmm. and, and, and i think to your that, point going, yeah this is just, i mean i think to your that's part of what's so fascinating about the metaphor or the story and the legend and the as as real and as a metaphor of that david ought to always played this role in his life but he still allowed him into the sangha and he he, and he was a troublemaker the whole time, but he yep. still, it, up to a certain point, he allowed him to stay in. And then at a certain point, he had to hold the boundary and, like, expel him or whatever. But right. that right. sense of, like, you know, he wasn't trying to just banish everyone or, you know, that, that right. there's a way that you can, we can have that ability to keep people in our lives who are bad behaving. <laughs> right. But still, but then there's a limit to where, to actually, it's like, okay, and someone has to be the grown up to make sure this you know they get that they they can't just treat you however they want yeah that's true and david data was a bad boy mm -hmm. there's no question about it <laughs> chana chana the charioteer he 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 grew very conceited because he was the buddha to be he, he was prince gotama he was the charioteer and he really identified with that so he had this sense of entitlement and would just do what he wanted to do and not help other monks. And it just kept going on and on for so long. They were so patient with him. But finally, they, they, they banned him. That mm -hmm. Brahmadanda is the word for it. it it's, they, 
They just don't talk to them. And eventually they go away. It's the equivalent of death. Yeah, it's fun reading those stories because there's there's a lot of misbehaving monks and nuns out there. And yeah. There, there's yeah. some good stories about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I think they're good yeah. to tell. I think they're yes. really helpful to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions out there from anyone? None of you have a Devadatta in your life? <laughs> there's a few... And sometimes the Devadatta is can be a very close friend, and they just go through these periods of like they black out, and another part of them steps up, and you see it all, and you even try to mirror it, explain it, uh, but it's not seen. It's not understood. And, and we have no control over that. And that's, that's the karma that the, the particular person who may be car causing us some grief or some outright harm or betrayal, you know, or a lot of sadness and confusion, we're, we're left with that. That's our teaching. And, and instead, of, instead of blaming it on the personality is just the recognition of this Devadatta archetype, you know, who, who had the karmic forces to try and harm or kill the Buddha. Quinn. Sun? Uh, no, Sun. Let's see, can you unmute? Let's see. Oh, I think you just changed the video, the camera to the other side. Okay, I hear you. There we go. Well, but I hope we can watch Buddha later. Is it Devadatta? What did about Devadatta? Um, did he become a Pacheka yeah. Buddha later? I don't. I I think the Buddha predicted how many, how long he'd be in those. Um, undesirable realms, but it was a real long time. So, I, you know, he's not out 2,600 years later. <laughs> <laughs> he has a bit more to go. I do remember reading somewhere about, you know, because like in so many of these Jataka tales, the Buddha, it's like, in this, I was a prince, and here I was king of the deer, and I was king of the lions, and he always had these like very nice like rebirths. <laughs> but that that there are a few incidents in his life where there's evidence that he had bad karma, right? That he, right. the Buddha himself, had done something wrong in the past in order for these things to happen. And yeah. two of the 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 elephant and the and the rock hitting his foot, I can't remember what they are, but they're the, the I think the. The current the Buddha at some past life had slandered another Buddha right. million, millions of lifetimes yeah. in the in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And that was part of the and there was some other reason why he had, you know, this other thing happen to him. So also that sense of our equanimity with our our kama, you know. I think that really helps a lot and and our whole sort of psyche neuron network. It helps settle it with some understanding. Actually, Soon you're correct. Uh, it was predicted that at some future time that uh, Devadatta would be again reborn as a human and would attain Pacheka Buddha status, the silent Buddha status, a non-teaching Buddha with, with, all the, with all the benefits of enlightenment, but not a teacher. Hmm. So there's hope for... All of us. <laughs> You're welcome. Tell me something interesting soon, next week, 
about <laughs> Devadatta? I mean, try <laughs> just one little <laughs> thing. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, and there's always hope, but um, we need to do our best not to uh, do the wrong things first. That's right. <laughs> but you know, the first Chataka tale, speaking of the good positions that we usually find the Bodhisattva being reborn in, remember he's the, he's the hare. And a, a monkey donates bananas to a, a, a monk and a seal donates fish and and the rabbit had nothing so it, and the rabbit was the bodhisattva so he threw himself in the fire as an offering but the fire didn't burn him because of the purity of an, an intention of his dana of his gift but that's why in the buddhist world we see a rabbit in the moon So the next time, look up and, and, and see how cool it is to see this rabbit in, on the cool moon who got there because of his generosity. If you all have your Brahma Viharas here in the heart and you're in perfect equanimity and you know exactly what to do, the next time a David Data interferes in your path, then we wish you we wish you blessings and beauty and loving kindness until next week. Take care, everyone. And just a reminder that next uh, Friday we'll be starting um, a retreat. So the next Sunday sitting um, will just be a, the talk from the Sunday talk on the retreat and actually for the following one also. So for a couple of weeks with, um, you know, without the kind of Q&A and, and sitting portion of it. But a lot of you will be on retreat with us anyhow. So we'll see you there. If you forgot to sign up, you still can. Yes, there's, <laughs> there's still time. And for full time or part time options, you know, and and again, you know, you'll have the recordings or the weekend option. Um, you know, you'll have access to the recordings for a few months until our probably until our November retreat. Yeah. But yeah, otherwise we take care and take care of your devadatas, and we'll see you soon. Aloha. Aloha.